What's going on YouTube? My name is Chris and whoop. Oh, sorry. Ah. What's going on YouTube? My name is Chris and welcome to Immodern Nation. Now, all jokes aside, I hope everybody is staying safe out there. Remember to follow your local and state guidelines. Make sure that you are staying inside, only going outside when you need to. Make sure you wash your hands. Don't touch your face, just like mama taught you. And lastly, please stay away from people. If you're watching this video, you're probably already doing that last one. Okay, so you can get rid of this scary stuff here. So you've got an idea for a project, and that's fantastic, because many great projects start out as just an idea. But, oh, you didn't think about how am I going to power this thing? Well, in today's video, I'm going to show you numerous ways that you can power your electronics project. First question you have to ask yourself is, where is this project going to be? Is it going to be underneath your desk, on your desk? Is it going to be plugged into the wall, hanging onto the wall? Is it going to be attached to you? Is it a wearable? Is it like a t-shirt design? These are some of the questions that you need to ask yourself because then you'll have to determine whether you can use a plugged in power source where you're tethered to the wall or if you're using batteries for a mobile project that can move around, be taken with you. If your project is gonna be stationary, you're pretty much tethered to the wall and your choices are either AC directly from a wall outlet, uh, AC to DC wall adapter, USB from a USB port. But if you can move the project around, batteries is pretty much all you can do until you know better technology comes around in like 10 years. One of the easiest ways to get power is direct from the DC jack. And you've seen me do this in many videos, including the Steam Link video, the EVGA PowerLink video, and even the Synology Disk Station video. And it's really simple. All you need to do is solder a positive lead to the positive connection and a negative lead to the ground connection. And of course, you'll know how much power you're going to get out of this because you can either measure it with a multimeter or you could simply look at the DC jack, which will tell you what the output power is going to be. And like I said before, if your project is going to be mobile, then batteries will be your only solution. But what batteries can we use? Well, I'm a big fan of lithium ion batteries. In fact, I've used the lithium ion 1860 batteries just recently in my Mickey Mouse ears project. In fact, I used two 18650 batteries in parallel to get 3.7 volts. Now, if you're looking to power an Arduino board, then 3.7 volts is what you want. And that's about the amount of power that you'll get from an 18650 battery. What I like about 18650 batteries is that they have a large capacity. In fact, they're just slightly bigger than AA batteries, yet they're so energy dense, they're perfect for a lot of projects. Now, word of caution for those of you using lithium ion batteries. You want to use this with a battery management system that includes overcharge and over discharge protection circuitry. What this means is that the batteries will not charge more than they need to be charged and they won't over discharge. These can both result in fire if you're not careful. You might also remember a time when hoverboards and quadcopters were exploding into flames. Be careful. Now the other side of the coin is lithium polymer batteries. These are the most energy dense, inexpensive, and dangerous batteries that you can use. These batteries are often commonly found in cell phones. Do you remember the Galaxy Note 7? Cause Samsung hopes you don't. Now what are you gonna do if your project requires less voltage than the voltage that you have? Like for example, let's say you need five volts to run an LED strip and you only have 12 volts. Well, I guess you could put a, a big resistor in place of it to bring the voltage down, but that resistor is gonna get really hot and could potentially catch fire. I have two solutions for you. The first one is a linear voltage regulator. So linear regulators are great if you have small changes in voltage. Linear voltage regulators have three legs like the one pictured here and you could use that to bring the voltage down gradually. So for example, if you have a 12 volt input, you can use a linear regulator to bring it down to five volts. This could be useful for say, powering a solid state drive. These linear regulators are very inefficient and they can get very hot because of the voltage drop. And so with that, you would need to cool it down with some sort of heat sink. So instead I have another solution. It's called a DC-DC step down converter or a converter. I said converter. 
Stop bleeping me! I said buck, not the other word. They're called buck converters because they buck the voltage. You know, like a bucking bronco. I'm talking about a horse here, guys. <laughs> buck converters become especially useful when you have a much larger voltage drop. Say, instead of a 12 volt power source, you have a 20 volt power source and you need to bring the voltage down to five volts. You can simply use the trim pot on the buck converter in order to bring the voltage down. Using a multimeter, you can then measure the output to confirm that you have five volts. I actually use one of these buck converters inside my GTX 1060 graphics card for the OLED display mod. And in that video, I took the 12 volt rail from the PCIe Express connector and converted it to seven volts for the VN on my Arduino Nano. All right, so what about the other side of that? What if you need to boost your power up? Well, there's a solution for that as well. They are called boost converters, that's right. So boost converters work exactly the way that they sound. They increase the voltage. Let's say you only have 3.7 volts from that battery, but you need 12 volts. You can use a boost converter by turning the trim pot, you're able to increase the voltage. This would be useful if you're running a 12 volt LED strip and you only have maybe five volts USB power. Speaking of USB, let's talk about some of the power inside of the computer. We'll start with the USB. So the USB provides five volts at one amp maximum. Um, you might have heard me talk about this a lot when I did the Wii U solid state drive mod video. Again, all these videos that I'm talking about, you can check them out by clicking on the card in the upper right hand corner. Here you can see the pin out for the USB. You have power and ground and the two pins on the inside are the data send and return. Next, let's talk about SATA. So SATA is a power connector used for powering hard drives. SATA runs at five volts. And so you can use these with a SATA connector to tap power for say like a five volt LED strip, which I have done uh, behind me uh, when I did the GPU backplate mod. Next, we have Molex. Molex is one of the common power connectors inside of a computer. So you have four wires, a yellow, a red, and two black. As you might have guessed, the two black wires are ground, the yellow wire is 12 volts, and the red wire is 5 volts. So if you need 5 volt power, you can get it from the red. If you need 12 volt, you can get it from the yellow. Or if you use the yellow wire as power and the red wire as ground, you can actually get 7 volts. This is actually very useful for underpowering PC fans. I talk a lot more about the Molex connector when I did the LCD side panel mod, where I used the 12 volt part of the connector to power the very bright LED lights inside of the computer case and the five volts to power the LCD monitor. Last is the PCIe cables. Now you've seen me use this connector for both the EVGA PowerLink mod and for the OLED display mod. Now, I don't recommend using this one just because if you cross some wires accidentally, you could end up frying your graphics card. I chose to do it and I was very careful to make sure that I checked the continuity to make sure that none of the wires were improperly grounded before I plugged the graphics card in and turned it on. I don't wanna hear any crying that your $1,500 graphics card is fried because you didn't do the proper precautions. Lastly, there are fuse taps and T-taps. These are especially useful for finding power inside of the car. I've used uh, T-taps in the past to derive power for LED lights right off of the cigarette lighter. So instead of having to solder directly to the cigarette lighter itself, I can simply splice directly into the wire and it provides me the 12 volt power that I need. I briefly used a T-tap to get the RPM signal from the fan of my GTX 1060 for the OLED graphics card mod. Then there are fuse taps. These work by replacing the actual fuses inside of your car and they can also be used to tap 12 volts as well. All right, so that concludes our video. Let me know what you think in the comment section. How are you tapping power for your projects? If you have any questions, make sure you leave them in the comment section below. Also, if there is a power solution that I haven't mentioned, be sure to include that in the comment section below. Remember, no matter what your project is, there's always a power solution. The question is, what are you gonna build next? 
Thank you so much for checking out this video, and if you enjoyed it, make sure you slap that like button below and share the video. And while you're at it, why not join the Modern Nation and get subscribed by clicking on that subscribe button below. And hey, when you do, don't forget to click on the bell icon inside the button to be notified the moment that I release new videos. If you have any comments or questions, be sure to leave them for me in the comment section below, or why not hit me up on social media? I'd love to hear from you guys. And when you buy products from Amazon, consider using the affiliate links in the video description below. Thank you again so much for watching, and I will see ya.